Hello, everyone. My name is Yue Yingyi. I'm a final year grad student from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to present our work of super resolution cosmological simulation on behalf of our team. Uh, and thanks the organizer for giving me this opportunity. Here is the list of the team member. Uh, this work is carried out with Dr. Indy from Flatiron Institute, uh, Professor Rupert Croft and Tipton and Dimatteo from Carnegie Mellon, Simon Bird from UC Riverside, and Yu Fan from UC Berkeley. Uh, this is the outline of my talk today. Uh, first, I will uh, briefly talk about what is super resolution and why do we want to develop super resolution model in cosmological simulations. And then I will uh, go through the methodology carried out in this work, as well as uh, bring about some main aspects that I think is important when carrying out this task. Uh, then I will uh, talk about the series of tests that we performed on the uh, super resolution field as a validation for this method. And then finally, I will uh, talk about the potential usage and the future prospects. This work is fully publicly available. Uh, here are the introductory and the validation paper and the uh, pipeline of the training, uh, the, uh, the model architecture, as well as the trained model in this work are also available in the online repository. Uh, first, uh, why do we want to do super resolution in cosmological simulation? That is because the uh, traditional method for cosmological simulation can be very extensive. So here we are looking at a uh, large cosmological n-body simulation uh, from Millennium XSL. This is a very large volume simulation uh, where this background is like four gigaparsec uh, cube. Uh, cosmological n-body simulation, they uh, solve the nonlinear gravitational evolution with a bunch of uh, massive tracer particles and they uh, model the structure formation that uh, cross over many orders of magnitude. So um, with a given box volume, the computational cost for n-body simulation will quickly go up when we go to higher resolution with more tracer particles. Uh, that is because on one side, we need a, a larger computer memory in order to host that many particles. And uh, on the other side, we need uh, like more accurate time integration to solve those nonlinear orbital evolution uh, in those small scale structures. So the time complexity brought by the spatial resolution will quickly build up the computational cost for cosmological simulation. And when we go to the cosmological hydrodynamic simulation, uh, they will become even more expensive because they uh, need to model the baryon physics as well as the uh, galaxy formation uh, on multiple scales. So here is an illustrative plot of uh, cosmological hydro simulation of galaxy formation. Uh, this plot is uh, asteroid simulation, which is carried out by our group. Uh, asteroid is one of the largest uh, galaxy formation simulation in terms of the particle load. So uh, modern galaxy formation simulation concurrently model the uh, gravitational evolution uh, of the structure formation uh, the bionic physics, like the cooling and heating of the gas, uh, they model the uh, formation of the galaxies and supermassive black holes, uh, as well as the feedback from the stars, uh, supernovae, and the activity of agents. All those different physical processes are modeled on uh, many different scales. And in order to properly resolve the uh, uh, physical process that involved in galaxy formation, uh, and to resolve the galaxies in mass region of like 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 solar mass. Uh, galaxy formation simulation need to retain a decent high uh, resolution to capture those uh, physical process. And the, th this high demand in the spatial re resolution limits the capability of galaxy formation simulation to reach a large volume size. So uh, here is a collection of uh, many of the state-of-art galaxy formation simulation. Uh, the x-axis here uh, represents the volume of the simulation, and the y-axis here is the uh, mass resolution of the simulations. Uh, and those uh, dashed lines marks the particle load required for the given simulation volume and the, the mass resolution. Those circle marks are the uh, uniform volume cosmological simulation of galaxy formation. Uh, you can see many uh, familiar names here. Uh, so most of those uh, cosmological uh, 
galaxy formation simulation are uh, in the uh, volume of in order of like a hundred megaparsec cube, and those uh, triangles are the uh, zoom simulation where people model a smaller system but uh, can reach much higher uh, mass resolution. So we can see that uh, there is a tension between the uh, simulation volume and the resolution. And uh, on one side, we want to model a uh, uh, we want to model the cosmological simulation in a larger volume. Uh, in order to achieve a better statistics of the uh, galaxies and objects that can be that can be compared to the uh, large sky surveys, and uh, also with a larger volume, uh, we can better study the mode coupling between the long and the short mode, uh, such as the supersampling effect. And uh, on the other side, we also uh, want to reach a higher resolution to better uh, model the physical process of galaxy formation as well as resolve the internal structures inside the halos. So uh, because of the limit in the computational uh, resource, many of the simulation had to either compromise the volume or uh, compromise the resolution. And in often, in many cases, they had to compromise both. Uh, so the, we're in a region where the future large sky survey will cover a very large cosmological volume. Uh, for example, like uh, DESI or the Rubin Observatory, uh, they will be able to uh, sample the, ga the galaxy on order of like tens of millions of galaxies and cover a large volume, a large cos cosmological volume of an order of like 50 to 100 gigaparsec cube. So uh, we did, uh, so for the next generation cosmological simulation, we desire to go to a large volume that can be comparable uh, to match the, the amount of samples that can be uh, covered by those future large sky surveys, as well as uh, remain the uh, decent high enough resolution uh, to properly model the galaxy formation. And these two demand, uh, well, so these two requirements in, uh, in the simulation volume and the mass resolution uh, will incur huge computational costs. Um, it's very, it, it is a very challenging task, both because of the limited computational resource and also because of the technical challenging in the code development to carry out those kind of large tasks. Therefore, that's why we want to resort to uh, the deep learning method that can maybe help us to model those expensive small scale physical process uh, as a potential method to further extend the dynamical range that can be covered by future cosmological simulations. So uh, what is super resolution? Uh, so the idea of super resolution here uh, is originate from, uh, in, from the computer vision field where uh, people train a deep neural network to enhance the resolution of a low resolution image uh, to add small details of, on those uh, fuzzy low resolution image to make it look like a high resolution image. So these are the plots from the initial paper that developed the super resolution generative model to carry out this task. Uh, on the right, those uh, three images are uh, the three super resolution image that generated by the trained models uh, from this low resolution image. And the leftmost uh, plot is a, uh, the original high resolution image. Uh, so inspired by uh, this, uh, what we want to do here is to train a super resolution deep learning model to uh, generate the small scale features in the low resolution simulations and make them uh, as um, uh, and make them uh, like authentic as the uh, a real high resolution simulation from a embodied simulation. So here is uh, a, an illustration of uh, our trend model uh, result. So on the left is, uh, so what we are seeing here is a dark matter density field uh, centered on a, uh, on a very massive halo. And the, on the left is a, a low resolution uh, embodied simulation field. And the, on the right is uh, the super resolution uh, dark matter density field generated by our super resolution model. And the, on the middle, what in the middle is a real high resolution uh, uh, field from the real M-body simulation. So our trend super resolution model are able to produce the full phase space distribution of the tracer particles 
and the unbound simulation uh, and uh, the uh, generated super resolution field uh, uh, can have good statistical agreement with the high resolution uh, field and uh, the uh, relevant computational cost is negligible. So uh, as the proof of concept for our work, we first develop our super resolution model on the simplest n-body simulation because n-body simulation are uh, simple and uh, very well validated. And in the next part of my talk, I will uh, briefly go through some main aspects that uh, some details that I think uh, is important when we design this task. So the first aspect I want to talk about is how do we format the n-body simulation? In this work, we format the n-body simulation uh, in the Lagrangian prescription. We know that n-body simulation uh, use a bunch of massive tracer particles with their position and the velocity to represent the underlying dynamic field of density and velocity. And the initial configuration for those tracer particles uh, is usually a uniform parti uh, Cartesian grid. And uh, the tracer particles evolve under the gravitational evolution uh, to represent the underlying field. So a natural way to extract the particle position is to calculate their displacement, which is de defined as the final position of the particle at a given time uh, relative to the initial uh, Cartesian grid where that particle comes from. Therefore, we can format the n-body simulation as a 3D image with six channels, uh, where the voxel of this 3D image is the initial Cartesian grid, and the six channels corresponding to the component of the displacement and the velocity vector for the particle that originally from that voxel. Here is an illustration of uh, a low resolution n-body simulation uh, formatted uh, as a 3D image. This is a 3D image, uh, uh, but what, what, what we are showing here is a slice of this 3D image on the XY plane. And these are the six uh, values or the, or the component of the displacement and the velocity field associated to uh, each voxel of the 3D image. And uh, from the low rest simulation to the high rest simulation or to the super rest simulation, what we are doing here is to increase the size of the 3D image or the number of the voxels of the 3D image to represent more tracer particles and predict their full displacement and the velocity field. So this particle-based uh, Lagrangian description had several advantages in terms of uh, the super-resolution task. First is that from the low res to high res or the super res field, uh, we are upsampling the number of the tracer particles with less mass. Therefore, the total mass of the field is naturally conserved by this construction, by this uh, format of the simulation. And also, uh, the, uh, the Lagrangian prescription like inherits the uh, particle nature of the, the n-body simulation that can better describe a physical field with a large dynamic range uh, because it can, adaptively, it can adaptively resolve to the small scales of the high density region with a clustering of the tracer particles in their position. Uh, and uh, on the other side, if we instead super resolve the Eulerian space density field, then we need to map the particle uh, position on a uniform grid to get the Eulerian space density field. And when we want to resolve the uh, field of high density, then we need to map the field to a higher resolution uh, uniform grid. And uh, uh, it will increase the grid, grid size and make it much larger than the uh, uh, 3D, uh, than the fundamental grid of the n-body simulation. And the, the 3D image will have very large uh, size and make the uh, training process very expensive. And also uh, our super resolution output uh, predict the, uh, in this format can predict the, uh, the full uh, 60 phase space distribution of distinguishable tracer particles. And it, it, it can be formatted identically as a output from a real n-body simulation. Therefore, uh, it is uh, very uh, 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 handy for the post-processing. And we can uh, name our super resolution output as a super resolution simulation. The second aspect I want to talk about is the symmetry. Uh, because we know that the 
a statistical property for the simulation output is homogeneous and isotropic. Therefore, our super resolution operation should also preserve the corresponding symmetry. And uh, as I mentioned before, that the mass uh, uh, conservation is naturally preserved uh, due to our uh, format of the embodied simulation in Lagrangian prescription. And uh, here I'm going to talk about the translational symmetry. By translational symmetry, what we mean here is that we want a certain feature uh, will have uh, are recognized as the same. Uh, in other words, they have the same output, no matter this feature, uh, no matter where this feature locates in the entire input volume. And uh, this uh, translational symmetry is uh, uh, ensured by the architecture of the convolutional neural network by construction. So uh, convolutional neural network is the base of our uh, super resolution generative model. And it applied the same kernel to uh, scan through the entire low resolution field. And therefore it can make sure that a certain feature uh, in the input field are recognized as the same. And uh, sometimes the translational symmetry can be uh, broken uh, due to the boundary effect. And because of the nature of the uh, cosmological embody uh, simulation have periodic boundary condition. Therefore, uh, whenever uh, we uh, take a low resolution input field and pad the surrounding, and whenever we hit the boundary of the simulation box, we apply the periodic boundary uh, uh, for the padding. And uh, in this uh, combination, we can make sure that our entire super resolution operation preserve the translational symmetry. Uh, so in the real uh, cases, because the 3D image is very large in size and uh, is very memory consuming. So this is, uh, it's usually infeasible to uh, input the entire simulation volume for the super resolution operation. So uh, when we train the model or when we apply the super resolution model on a very large volume, we usually do this like by uh, first the crop the input low resolution field into many small chunks and the upper and the operates the super resolution model on those chunks individually. And then we piece up the resultant super resolution field together. And the translational symmetry can make sure that uh, the super resolution output processed in this way is identical as uh, we feed in the entire input low resolution field. And the, finally, uh, the rotation symmetry. So uh, we impose the rotational symmetry through the data augmentation. Uh, that means that like whenever we train the model, uh, we apply a random operation from the OH point group uh, before we, uh, after we take a batch from the training set. Uh, the OH point group is uh, the uh, 3D uh, rotational symmetry discretized on a cube. And the, the data augmentation is kind of like a brutal force approach to make the model to be aware of the ro rotational symmetry. And uh, as a side product, uh, the data augmentation augment our uh, training data by 48 times. And the third aspect I want to talk about is the stochasticity. Uh, I, would like, I would like to uh, stress that from the low rest to the high rest field, this is not a deterministic process. Instead, it is a one-to-many task. So uh, what we're seeing here is a dark matter density field of a low resolution simulation. And the, on the right-hand side, these are uh, three different realizations of the high resolution dark matter field from M-body simulation. So we can see that uh, they are identical in terms of the large scale feature, but on those uh, small scales, uh, each of the uh, high resolution M-body simulation can be different. So those different small scale features are determined by the high frequency mode, which is absent in the low resolution simulations. So the, uh, the, the way we uh, get those different realization of high res uh, field is uh, by populating the high frequency mode in the high resolution initial condition with a different random seed. And we end up with different realizations of the high res embody simulation that's all corresponding to the same low res uh, embody simulation. So with this in mind, uh, we know that uh, this stochastic nature of the super resolution task uh, bring some consequences. The first is that since there's no single ground truth of the high resolution field, uh, there are many realizations of them. Therefore, we cannot apply a simple pixel-wise loss 
uh, to minimize the uh, difference between a output super res field and a high res field uh, as what supervised learning doing because there's no single ground truth of the high resolution field. Um, the task of the super resolution is to try to produce a, 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 a super resolution field that uh, statistically match the property of authentic high resolution field instead of uh, produce a certain realization. Therefore, uh, we use the, the generative adversarial network uh, to replace the original single pixel wise loss. So what generative adversarial network doing is that we train a discriminator network uh, to uh, try to distinguish the input image being real or fake. And uh, uh, the generator are trained to try to fool the discriminator. Uh, so we train the generator and then uh, discriminator network alternatively as a competition. And during this adversarial training process, the discriminator will learn to do a better job at uh, distinguishing the input uh, image being real and fake. And the generator learns to uh, fool the discriminator by producing a super resolution field with higher and higher fidelity. So uh, also we need to know that uh, uh, since uh, we are trying to make uh, a probability distribution of different realizations of the super resolution field, we need to add stochasticity to our generative uh, network. Therefore, uh, through this training process, we need to add noise to the generator to allow it to produce different realizations of the super resolution field given a certain low resolution input. Uh, same as that uh, we should have different realization of the high resolution field corresponding to the same low res input. So here is a illustrative example of uh, our trend generative model. Uh, so with uh, different random noise, our model can produce the super resolution field with different realizations. Uh, you can see that uh, those uh, three fields are uh, produced by our trend generative network and the uh, they are identical on the large scale structure, uh, same as the low res field. And uh, they can produce different uh, small scale features by different random noise. So uh, uh, I, I need to mention that GAN is one of the many choices to train a generative network. So uh, the core idea of the generative model is that it tries to learn a full probability distribution of the data. And in our case, we want our generative uh, model to be able to resemble the full probability distribution of the high resolution field. And the noise here is like a random seed that allow us to uh, draw samples or realizations from this underlying full probability distribution of the high resolution fields. Uh, and uh, again, it's a very popular choice for training of the generative model uh, because uh, empirically it's a uh, can give better performance uh, compared to some other uh, training procedures such as the VAE. However, again, it's also notorious for, uh, uh, in the sense that they are very hard to train and the training process can be very unstable. So in our work, we also adopt some adaptation in our training procedure of GAN. First is that uh, we uh, apply the conditional GAN uh, in the sense that we, uh, when we train the discriminator, we also concatenate the, uh, the low resolution field uh, to the discriminator and uh, make this uh, network a conditional again. So it can help the generator to generate the super resolution samples with the right uh, coupling between the long and the short mode. Um, and also uh, we replace the original loss uh, for the uh, discriminator, which was a uh, binary cross entropy loss uh, with the Wesselstein loss and make uh, this model a Wesselstein gain. So the Wesselstein loss or the Wesselstein uh, matrix is a earth moving matrix that uh, better quantify the uh, distance between two probability distribution. So mathematically, it means that uh, the minimum amount of work that required to uh, move from one probability distribution to another. So in our case, the Wesselstein uh, distance uh, should be the distance between the probability distribution of the high resolution field and the super resolution field. And empirically, uh, Wesselstein again can help to stabilize the training of the 
uh, again, architecture and also uh, uh, able to help us uh, get better result. Uh, so now I'm going to briefly overview the schematic of our training procedure. So for our training set, we have uh, 16 pairs of the low res and the high res simulation pairs. And the, each of them have box size of 100 megaparsec and the, the low resolution uh, uh, simulation have 64 cube uh, and the high resolution field have particle load of 512 cube. So therefore our super resolution task is eight times higher in the spatial resolution and the uh, 512 times higher in the mass resolution. And the, uh, for the low resolution uh, box, as I mentioned before, we crop the uh, input field to uh, small chunks because of the limited memory of GPU. And uh, for each of the low resolution field, we pass it through the generator to uh, produce the full phase space distribution of the particle field. And for each of the super resolution field, we pair it with a high resolution field from the real M-body simulation and feed them to the discriminator and use Wessel's 10 uh, uh, again to uh, train the discriminator to distinguish the input field being real or fake. And also I need to uh, mention here that uh, we applied a trick here to use a uh, reversible operation to transform the uh, Lagrangian space uh, displacement field to the Olverian space density field uh, and the feed to the discriminator when we train the discriminator. And uh, uh, this helps to uh, strength, uh, to this helps to uh, make the discriminator more powerful by giving it the specific information of how the density field look like, and therefore the more powerful discriminator are able to guide the generator to uh, produce uh, a uh, more uh, realistic super resolution uh, output. So this is like a, a trick we applied uh, in the training procedure, and that turns out. Uh, to greatly improve our training results. And uh, here I'm going to briefly uh, go through the architecture of our generator and the discriminator here. So the architecture of our generator looks like a ladder. This is inspired from the style gen two. And uh, um, so the, the each round of the ladder will upsample the input image by two times higher in the spatial resolution. Therefore, we can see that we have uh, three rounds here, uh, and in total, we have sampled the input field by eight times in the spatial resolution. And the, the input low res field have uh, six channels of the particle displacement and the, the velocity. And the, those count blocks on the left uh, will map the input field to high dimensional latent space and, uh, the, the, and the add small scale details on that and those projection plates will project them back uh, to the output field. And the, uh, the details of those count block, they're composed by uh, the noise adding, the upsample interpolation, uh, the convolutional neural network, as I mentioned before, and the, also uh, the activation function, which uh, is uh, to rectify the output in each layer and the, uh, and the uh, add nonlinearity to the entire network. So uh, this is the uh, uh, this is also applied uh, in the in the in the projection process. So here uh, is the discriminator of uh, architecture. Uh, the discriminator architecture is uh, adopted from the residual network, uh, which is a very powerful network uh, in for the task of the classification. And uh, I will uh, skip the, the details here and uh, refer to uh, our uh, repository and the paper for more details. So now we have uh, go through the uh, methodology of how we develop the super resolution model. And for the next part of the talk, we will do some statistical comparison between the high res and the super resolution field. As I mentioned before that our super resolution model uh, are able to produce the full phase space distribu distribution of the tracer particles uh, with position and velocity that can be uh, formatted identically as the output from a real n-body simulation, high resolution n-body simulation. Therefore, we're able to uh, do some straightforward uh, analysis that is widely used in cosmological studies uh, on the, our super res and the high res field. Uh, we will first uh, do some full field statistics that include all the tracer particles in the simulation. 
volume. And then we will do the analysis based on the halo population, uh, which is more relevant to the observations. And for the test set of this work, we used uh, 10 pairs of the low res and the high res simulation, where the box size are equal to that we, uh, as that we used in the uh, training set, uh, yet uh, they have, uh, but with different realizations. So as the simplest uh, statistical comparison, we look at the matter power spectrum uh, of our super resolution field. So as the first step for the development of our super resolution model, uh, we train the model uh, on different uh, redshifts separately as a uh, test of its performance on different level of nonlinearities. So here we are comparing the uh, low res, high res, and the super res field uh, at redshift two and redshift zero. Uh, and the y-axis here is their dimensionless uh, power spectrum, which uh, quantified the uh, variation of the density field on different scales. And we can see that uh, the purple line is the low resolution field, uh, that their power quickly drop off when going to the small scales because of the lack of resolution on those small scales. Uh, however, we can see that our super resolution field are able to uh, reproduce the statistical variation of the uh, of the high resolution dark matter density field up to percent level accuracy. And the, we uh, like we know that uh, uh, the the evolved uh, matter density field is uh, uh, is a non Gaussian field. Therefore, it needs higher order. Uh, statistics uh, beyond the two-point correlation uh, to quantify it. So um, here we are measuring the bispectra of the high-res and the super-res field. So bispectra is the Fourier transform of the three-point correlation function. So uh, it basically uh, uh, quantify like given a uh, two uh, over density, the probability of the third over density of a given uh, mode. So here we're testing the bispectra with a triangle uh, configuration of a isosceles triangle, where uh, K1 is the, uh, large, the large scale mode and K2 equals to K3 are the small scale mode. So the isosceles triangle in this squeeze limit where the uh, K2 and the K3 are much larger than K1, uh, it's, uh, it quantified the, uh, the, how the small scale features are uh, dependent on the large scale mode. So uh, here we can see that uh, the bispectral result of our uh, super resolution field match uh, statistically matches well with that from the uh, high resolution field up to like 10% uh, accuracy and the well outperform that uh, from the low resolution field. Uh, it indicates that uh, our super resolution model can uh, well capture the response of the uh, small scale mode corresponding to uh, the large scale mode. Uh, and uh, uh, as we, uh, as our super resolution model can produce the full phase space distribution, including the velocity of the particle, we can also validate the velocity field uh, by looking at the redshift space uh, statistics. So um, in real observation, uh, because the peculiar the redshift effect produced by the peculiar velocity of the galaxies uh, degenerates with that from the Hubble expansion. Therefore, when we observe the galaxies in the redshift space, they will look distorted. So on the large scale, because of the uh, galaxies coherently fall into the uh, large clusters, um, it, uh, the, their, dis their spatial distribution will look squashed along the line of sight. And on the small scales, the velocity is dominated by the very realized version and their spatial, their corresponding spatial distribution will look like elongated. And uh, uh, in n-body simulation, we model this effect by uh, moving the particles uh, according to their uh, peculiar velocity along the line of sight and uh, uh, measure the uh, correspondent uh, power spectra. As the peculiar velocity makes the redshift space clustering being an isotropic, therefore, we, uh, this is a 2D power spectra, which is dependent on the angle uh, corresponding to the line of sight. And to compare the 2D power spectra that encodes the velocity distribution, here we uh, project the 2D, project, uh, 2D power spectrum on the basis of the Legendre polynomials 
And uh, here we plot the first three multiples here. We can see that the uh, super risk result can predict the 2D matter power spectra that in general match well with the high risk field, uh, yet uh, may maybe with a uh, like 10% small access at the smallest scale. But uh, in general, uh, it shows that the super risk field can predict a reasonable realization of the entire velocity field. So now we have uh, looked at the full field statistics that include all the particles in the dark matter field. And then we are going to move on to look at the statistics of the halo catalog. So the dark matter will collapse into very realized objects um, that, uh, of the dark matter halo that contain a bunch of substructures. Those substructures are the host of the galaxies uh, that are associated to the observed galaxy population. So and in many cosmological studies, a common practice people would do is to uh, produce, is to generate mock galaxy catalogs based on the halo and the subhalo population extracted from n-body simulation and make a comparison to the observations. So a potential usage of the super resolution model is to uh, deploy them on, the, on those large volume, low resolution simulation to efficiently produce the mock halo catalog for the halo population that cannot be resolved by those low rest simulations. And uh, for this usage, it's essential to do a uh, calibration or the uh, um, to, to do validation on the halo catalog statistics. And uh, uh, for the interest of time here, I will only uh, go through a subset of those uh, statistical comparison and refer to our paper for, for further details. So here is a visualization of the halo population of our uh, embodied simulation field. So here we uh, color the particles that associated with a uh, friend of friend halo in orange color. Um, here, uh, it, this is a zooming view of 10 megaparsec to visualize those um, uh, halo structures. We can see that the super rest field can resolve to those uh, small halos that are completely, completely absent in the low rest simulation. And the, the morphology of the halo looks uh, pretty reasonable. And the, uh, here is the, uh, the population of the substructures of the halo. Well, we run the Amiga halo find, finder to, to identify those uh, subhalos. So here the red uh, circles marks the host halo and the orange color marks the subhalo that associated with those uh, host halos. So here we make uh, some uh, quantitative uh, comparison between the halo population. Uh, what we are uh, seeing here is the halo mass function, which is the number histogram of the uh, histogram of the halo population as a function of the halo mass. We can see that uh, the low rest simulation can only resolve to the uh, halo to the mass regime of 10 to the 13 solar mass, while the super rest field can resolve the halos uh, of mass regime two orders of magnitude lower, and it can produce the population of those uh, small halos that uh, match excellent with the uh, halo abundance from the high resolution field. And uh, we note here the, the, the red band, band here is the mass resolution limit of uh, 300 particles, and uh, our super rest result uh, can produce the uh, halo population across uh, this order, uh, this many orders of magnitude, all the way down to the uh, resolution limit. Uh, and uh, here we also compare the abundance of the subhalos between the high res and the super res field. So the uh, so the black da dash line is the result from the super resolution field. Uh, we can see that our uh, super res uh, model do. Uh, predict a deficit in terms of the abundance of those substructures, especially for the subhalo population in the mass regime uh, below 10 to the 12 solar mass. Those uh, uh, it indicate that our super resolution model somehow missed um, part of those uh, small mass uh, substructures associated with uh, within the large halo. So this indicates that uh, our super resolution model uh, should in should be improved to in, in order to better resolve those small scale substructures. And uh, 
Uh, hopefully, this can be achieved by improve the training process of our super resolution model. And apart from the abundance comparison, we also look at the spatial correlation of the halo population. So what we're seeing here is the 2D contour of the spatial correlation uh, along and across the line of sight. And the solid line here is the result from the high-res field and the super-res field is shown in the dashed line. This elongated feature of the 2D contour along the line of sight is caused by the finger of God effect, where the visualized motion of the particles make the spatial clustering along the line of sight be elongated. We can see that the 2D contour of the high-res and super-res field match pretty well to the extent that they can be plot over, overlapping with each other. And uh, here we plot the projection of the uh, 2D, uh, 2D spatial correlation along the line of sight to recover the uh, projected uh, correlation that uh, basically recovered the real space clustering in the observations. And uh, we can see that uh, again, the uh, super res and the high res field uh, predict the, the projected uh, clustering of the halo uh, pretty well. For now, we have shown the validation of our generated super resolution field. Uh, so there are still some place where we can uh, try to make improvements such as the substructures, but overall the quantitative statistics of the super resolution field is quite satisfactory. And uh, before the test sets I showed uh, are, the, uh, are performed in 100 megaparsec box, uh, which is the same volume as, the, as that we used in the training set. And here we are deploying our super resolution model on a very large cosmic volume of one gigaparsec. So uh, this is a uh, test of uh, the capability of our model to uh, produce those large mock catalogs for the low rest simulation in a large volume. So uh, here's a uh, illustration of the low resolution simulation of one gigaparsec. And from that, we deploy our super resolution model to uh, get this very large uh, super resolution field with a particle of uh, 5,000 cube uh, in one gigaparsec. So a real M-body simulation with this uh, number of particle load will be very expensive to run. However, with our uh, trend uh, super resolution model, it only takes like 16 hours with a single GPU to uh, generate this uh, field. And we run the friend of friend Halo Finder on this a large cosmological volume. And uh, uh, we see that the statistics of the halo abundance match pretty well with the prediction of the high risk and the low risk simulations. Uh, and what we are zooming here is a very massive large system of a massive cluster uh, uh, with halo mass of 10 to the 14 solar mass. Uh, at, uh, so this massive system at this redshift is uh, very rare and uh, it is uh, not seen in the training set of our super rest model. However, uh, in the uh, our super rest model are able to uh, produce a reasonable morphology and halo profile for this kind of massive system. It demonstrates that uh, it has uh, some level of ex it can do some level of extrapolation to the systems that it is not trained on. Uh, we need to caveat that uh, we still need to, uh, do more rigorous uh, uh, calibration and uh, test and improvement of our super rest model to uh, generate uh, very large mock catalogs for the future surveys. But uh, this is a, a proof of concept of uh, the potential and the capability for uh, the super rest model to carry out those kind of tasks. And apart from the M-body simulation, we also developed the super resolution uh, for the hydro simulations. So here, uh, this is uh, where we develop our super resolution model on those kind of uh, very simple quick lemma alpha simulation, which uh, focusing on modeling the thermal property of the intergalactic medium gas. So this is the illustration of the gas density and temperature field. And uh, uh, based on that, we uh, can produce the mock observables like the lama alpha spectra that encode the density, temperature, and the peculiar velocity of those IGM gas. And our generated super resolution uh, 
field can produce the statistics of those lambda alpha spectra with reasonable agreements with the high risk field. But uh, in the current stage, we are still uh, seeking for the improvement and the uh, uh, further development of the of our model for those kind of tasks. And here I put my summary slide. So in this talk, um, uh, I introduced our super resolution model that are able to generate the full 60 phase space and body simulation uh, with uh, five times, uh, 12 times higher uh, in the mass resolution. And our generated super res field can give good statistical agreement with the authentic high res field. And it showed the potential to uh, be applied to very large cosmic volume and uh, generate mock cap box. And the field, for the challenge and the future directions, uh, we still need to improve the performance of our super resolution model on the small scales to predict more reliable uh, substructures. And also we want to uh, extend our super res model to accommodate for different cosmology and include the redshift dependency. And uh, in the future, we want to develop the super res model for the more expensive galaxy formation simulation um, uh, for the future uh, cosmological simulation of galaxy formation. And uh, this is the end of my talk and uh, thanks for your patience.